thank you, Ruben, Dominic, for uh, organizing this joint seminar series. It's super awesome. Uh, I'm really happy to have a chance to be part of this. So, so, so yeah, so uh, today, as Ruben said, I'm going to be talking about something that we're calling uh, Bose-Lettinger liquids. So this is uh, joint work with Sentil uh, and Ashvin. And uh, so it ha hasn't appeared on archive yet. You know, this is still nominally work in progress. And so uh, maybe, maybe the, the posting date is order of weeks from now, but uh, there are still some, some things in what follows that aren't, aren't completely, completely finalized. Uh, okay, so any, anyway, with that, with that uh, caveat out of the way, let's get started. So uh, I just have a few slides of, of motivation uh, to get started. And so, so uh, one thing that I kind of like, one, one classification uh, framework that I like for phases of matter, uh, classifies phases of matter sort of in terms of how much gaplessness they have. So by how much gaplessness, I mean how, how many low energy degrees of freedom uh, a given theory has. So of course, if we we're interested in a theory that only has uh, finitely many low energy degrees of freedom, uh, you know, such theories are often topological quantum field theories. And of course, uh, there's a very kind of power, powerful structural framework that uh, we've developed to understand these types of theories. And they're relatively well understood. Uh, going, increasing the amount of gaplessness uh, one level up, we could have something where the low energy uh, degrees of freedom are described by maybe a finite number of gapless QFTs. By this, I just mean, you know, for condensed matter people, I just mean that the we're imagining some theory where the gap closes at a finite number of points in momentum space. Uh, and when when this happens, often these these theories are described in the IR by quantum field theories. Often they're conformal. And in, in this case, when, when you know there's a very powerful again structural framework set up around CFT that we can use to understand these things. And while classif classifying and understanding conformal field theories is not easy, especially in greater than two dimensions. We, we still know that there are these things called scaling dimensions and OPE coefficients and crossing symmetry and stuff. And there's sort of a clear framework that we use to understand these kind of theories. Uh, and then, then we can go up one, one level further, which is where we consider theories that have a lot of, they're very, very gapless, have a lot of low energy degrees of freedom. Uh, and by, by infinite number of gapless QFTs, what I, what I really just mean is that we, we're thinking about some theory where the, the gap closes along a manifold in momentum space that is bigger than zero. So we have a lot of gapless degrees of freedom. Um, of course, the canonical, the, the example of uh, these kind of phase of matter is a Fermi liquid and also have examples where Fermi liquids and you add various things to them. Uh, but uh, in contrast to maybe the, the first two classes of, uh, above, when we have a, this very, very large number of gapless degrees of freedom, it's sort of an example, you know, one might wonder if, if there's sort of a systematic framework for understanding these kind of uh, theories using some sort of CFT-like thing, or, uh, you know, maybe, maybe there are actually some constraints on the sort of symmetries or, or that you need to get a, a theory like this, or maybe it can only arise in, when you have some particular form of a UV Hilbert space or something like this. And anyway, since since this third class of very gapless matter is, of course, very important for, I don't I don't need to emphasize how important this is for, for doing condensed matter physics. Uh, it would be nice to sort of understand in sort of a broad sense what uh, what is possible uh, within this class of theories. So uh, in this talk, we're going to take a we're going to kind of take this philosophy of exploring what's possible, and we're going to uh, I'm going to explain an example of a of a phase of matter which lies in the of families bosons. So the UV Hilbert space is uh, uh, bosonic, and in this case, you know we don't have any degeneracy pressure to st stabilize a large amount of gaplessness like we do in a Fermi liquid. Uh, and so, yeah, yeah. So, so if something like this can exist, it's interesting and helps us kind of explore further this third class of phases of matter. So, the 
g gave me inspiration going forward into thinking about how to address this problem. One, one point of inspiration is some work that was uh, recent work by Dominic and Ryan and Central on something, something called, that they called ersatz Fermi liquids. Uh, what, what they showed essentially is that uh, if you have a very gapless theory in the sense where you have uh, particle number conservation and translation symmetry, then there are some kinematic constraints that you can place on the IR theory. They're very strong and tell you that, in fact, if you have a compressible theory, meaning a theory that is defined at a uh, continuous range of density densities, then your IR description for this phase actually has to be such that there's a, it possesses a very, very large emergent symmetry group. Uh, in fact, this emergent symmetry group has to be bigger than any compact Lie group. So it has to be this huge, huge, a huge, huge number of emergent symmetries. Uh, so just review, uh, I, Fermi, Fermi liquid is the best understood example of a very gapless matter. So let's just review how this occurs in a Fermi liquid, right? So here, here, here's, a, here's a Fermi surface in, in two dimensions. Uh, and this one, one way that is very helpful uh, to think about Fermi, Fermi liquids is to think about them as sort of consisting of a large number of one dimensional, one plus one dimensional uh, theories all sort of stapled together. So what we do is we uh, we look at the IR physics of the Fermi liquid, which is contained in the modes that live right near, right next to the Fermi surface, and we linearize the dispersion about the Fermi surface. And when when you do that, you see that the Fermi liquid can be described by essentially a sum of one-dimensional uh, Dirac fermions, where each fermion is chiral and has uh, would appear in a Lagrangian in, in, in this way that I've indicated. Here, uh, gamma is going to be labeling an angle on the Fermi surface, and these fermions disperse only along the direction normal to the surface of the Fermi surface. And it, it turns out that the when you look at the IR fixed point for the Fermi liquid, it is such that it is invariant under a very large symmetry group uh, because the charge density at each point on the Fermi surface is uh, conserved separately. So you, you can loosely think of this as have a, a having sort of an infinite number of uh, conserved charges, one for each point on the Fermi surface. So th this is, this is uh, a very, very large emergent symmetry group. In fact, it's, this, uh, it's a loop group. And uh, yeah, so uh, if, if we are interested in exploring further uh, examples of phases of matter that can occur in this very gapless uh, part of the classification, then it, because uh, the, the work in, regarding this Arsat's Fermi liquid places very general uh, kinematic constraints on these types of phases of matter, it might behoove us to look for uh, examples that can kind of be understood from a similar framework uh, as to Fermi liquids, namely where we have a lot of sort of uh, uh, a lot of maybe one plus one dimensional fields with a bunch of conservation laws. This, this is just kind of like a, 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 a maybe a, a flavor of what it would be profitable to pursue and coming up with new examples. Um, and then the, the other uh, piece of motivation for me was, uh, com comes from something called exciton Bose liquids and uh, re related models that have been studied. So uh, exciton Bose liquids, uh, this, is a, this is a phase of matter that was studied by Paramakanti, Valencia, and Fisher back in uh, 2002, I believe, but which has also kind of reappeared recently in the context of uh, fractons. And uh, what I, I'm not really going to explain what what this this model is, but uh, I'm just going to tell you that they they, they studied uh, a model which is such that the dispersion relation in the IR has this form that I plotted here, where the uh, dispersion is degenerate along this cross in momentum space. Uh, so cer certainly this constitutes uh, if you have a dispersion like this, certainly you have a very very large number of gapless uh, degrees of freedom, right? Because you one might regard this cross as a, as a Bose surface, essentially. Um, and, and so, the, yeah, so, so something like this would provide an example uh, of a very gapless phase of matter in the, uh, in the same sense as which I discussed a few slides ago. Uh, but the problem with this, mo this and related models is that they require a very, very large symmetry group to be stable. So in particular, uh, these, these models are really only stable if you impose uh, a symmetry group, which is such that 
the particle number is conserved along every row and column of the lattice on which these theories are defined. So in the, in the, in the thermodynamic limit, you essentially need to impose an infinite number of conservation laws for these phases to be stable. Now, and these, these are, this, this symmetry group that you're opposing is a UV symmetry group, right? Uh, now, of course, in, in condensed matter physics, we really want to be assuming a UV symmetry group, which is very small, uh, certainly, certainly not infinite dimensional. We're, we're, we're okay with an infinite dimensional, very large emergent symmetry group in the IR, but uh, if we, we don't really want to be inputting such, such a large symmetry group into the UV. Uh, so what we want to do is see if there's maybe some uh, alternate way of looking at phases like this or some generalization which is stabilized in the presence of a UV symmetry group, which is finite, which doesn't require a, in, a extensively large symmetry group to be stable. Okay. So uh, I'm, the, the approach and kind of the plan of attack and what follows is, is the, the following. So we're going to approach the, this problem in sort of the same way in which we would approach studying a Fermi liquid. Uh, namely, we're going to be working in the continuum. We're going to have rotational invariance for simplicity. Um, like in the Fermi liquid, we're going to try to uh, use our understanding of quantum field theories in one plus one dimensions to, make, to construct something that lives in higher dimensions. Uh, and like I just said, we're going to be working with a small uh, UV symmetry group. Uh, maybe U1 plus a few other things. And as just a sort of a preview of the phenomenology that we're going to find, we're going to find some phases that uh, don't have quasi particles. They have uh, some continuously varying exponents for their correlation functions. And in some sense, some senses they'll be able to be thought of as bosonic analogs of Fermi liquids, but in some other senses they'll uh, appear to be rather different. Okay, so now uh, I'm going to get started. So the the starting point is as follows: if if we want to make a theory uh, constructed of bosons, which is very gapless, then since we don't have uh, we don't have the tool of degeneracy pressure like we have in fermionic systems, what we're going to have to do is we're going to have to essentially just hard code this the gaplessness into the UV model by working with a dispersion that is gives you gapless degrees of freedom along a large uh, portion of the momentum space. So what we're going to do is we're going to assume, uh, we're going to consider models that in the UV have a dispersion possessing a minimum along a sphere in momentum space. So you know, it, in two dimensions, for example, it looks something like this figure in the top right, where the dispersion has a minimum along a circle. Uh, OK, so this maybe this sounds a little bit fanciful. We, you know, we don't usually consider theories with dispersion like this, but uh, you know, th there are non-zero non number of experimental examples where things like this em emerge. So I think everyone knows this, uh, the, this bottom right picture of the uh, dispersion of excitations in helium, where we have the, the, the roton minimum occurs at finite wave vectors. And OK, in this example, maybe the, the roton minimum is, the, the rotons are gapped, but maybe you can imagine bringing that gap down with pressure or something. Uh, you know, there are also, you can also construct examples using maybe bosons with spinner coupling. Uh, there are some things that, some examples that appear in the context of superinductivity. There are even some magnetic systems where you have, uh, uh, where you have this kind of dispersion. And so, while our focus in this talk is not going to be on any particular experimental application, and it's more really just asking the question of what's possible, it's not really an un unreasonable thing to do from the point of view of uh, experiments. And so, uh, yeah, so, so like, like I said, we're going to be working with a small symmetry group in the UV for, in what, in what follows, we're going to uh, take that symmetry group to consist of three parts. We're gonna have translation symmetry. We're gonna have particle number symmetry. So we're gonna, working, gonna be working with conserved complex bosons. And we're also furthermore gonna be assuming the existence of a particle hole symmetry. So this is equivalent to working at zero density for the bosons. Uh, this extra particle hole symmetry is going to be is, is going to be rather immaterial uh, for the discussion that follows in one dimension, but will actually be play an important role uh, for the two-dimensional discussion. Okay, so we're going to get warmed up by 
looking at uh, a, a one-dimensional example. So we're, we're, we're going to find it, trying to find a very gapless uh, one-dimensional theory of bosons, where very gapless just means that the uh, the dispersion the uh, the dispersion goes to zero at more than one point in the Fermi uh, So what we're going to do is we're going to consider a, a Lagrangian of the following form uh, written at the top. So this Lagrangian is uh, we have we have some bosonic field psi. Uh, because of the particle hole symmetry I just mentioned, there's no linear time derivative term appearing here. It's just partial tau squared. And we're going to have some interactions. And then the thing that is going to make this very interesting is that the uh, the spatial derivative term we're going to take is going to be this this interesting combination here, part, partial x minus kb squared squared. So what this does is it gives you a dispersion relation that has minima at plus minus kb, where kb we're going to call it this, the the Bose momentum, right? Is the momentum at which the dispersion goes to zero. So here here's here it's, here's what uh, the dispersion looks like. Uh, and just like we would do if we were thinking about a, a Fermi liquid in, or, or a Leutinger liquid in, in one plus one dimensions, what we're going to do is we're going to study the IR theory by getting rid of all the uh, modes of psi that live away, far away from the two Bose points, plus minus KB. And we're going to integrate them out. And we're going to be left with a, a theory that has modes supported right next to these two Bose points, plus minus KB. Uh, as, as indicated in the figure. Question. And what we're going, uh, yeah. So do you fine tune the chemical potential term to zero? How should I think about this? Yeah, yeah, so we're, uh, we, we are fine tuning the chemical potential term to zero. I, I'm interested in this limit of particle where we have particle hole symmetry. Well, I don't, um, I don't think that the Psi star Psi does not break. Uh, my chemical, um, okay, maybe I should say mass term. M size. Mass term? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, indeed. So I, I'm, I'm going to, I I don't want the, the if I have a mass term, then I can, a, a positive mass term, I can make them all massive, and I don't want that. So uh, in, indeed, yeah, that's right. So this is some critical point. Is that how I should? Uh, yeah, you, 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 can, you can think of it that, that way. We have to, we have to tune the chemical potential or, you know the chemical chemo potential will appear with a with a psi squared term. Uh, we we have to uh, tune that to zero. Mm -hmm. the, in, in in one dimension, this uh, uh, this this tuning to the zero density point is not important. Uh, well, in in that if I don't have this assumption, then I can consider theories at finite density, which uh, don't require tuning to this point, which still have both points. But in two dimensions, it will be more important. Mm -hmm. Um, so, so in order to study the IR theory, what we do, just like we, what we would do in uh, discussion of the Fermi liquid, is we take, we write our field psi as, uh, as a linear combination of slowly varying fields around the two Bose points. So we're going to take out the fast varying phase from the, the Bose momentum here and split it up as e to the i k b x psi, psi right, e to the minus i k b x uh, psi left, where these Psi right and psi left are going to be slowly varying fields about these two uh, points. Okay, and then we're we're going to take that uh, we're going to take that decomposition of psi, plug it into the action, and see what we get. Uh, since we've taken out that fast varying phase, the psi left and psi right are very very slowly, and they have you know they appear in the Lagrangian in a form like this. They just look like uh, relativistic bosons essentially. And in order to study this theory, you know, we have we have interacting bosons like this in one one plus one dimensions. The, how, how we study this theory is we uh, imagine we're, we we write the psi alpha where alpha is left or right in a phase representation like this uh, e to the i phi phi alpha, and then we just write down uh, you know, we're interested in IR physics. We just write down an effective field theory for these phase fields uh, with with you know. Keep keeping track of, for example, vertices by using the uh, fields dual to phi in the usual way, familiar in one plus one dimensions. So in order to write down the effective field theory, uh, we need to know how symmetries act on these fields, right? So uh, you can see that the particle number conservation symmetry just acts by 
shifting these phi's by a constant, right? Because it just acts as a U1 phase on this on the size. Uh, translation, uh, because the these two phi phi fields are representing fluctuations uh, lo located at uh, non-zero momentum. When I act with translation, these these phases shift uh, accordingly. So, for example, the 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 phase field at the right most point is going to shift by plus kb a under translation by a distance a, uh, and likewise for the field the, the phase at the left uh, point. And then this particle hole symmetry that I was talking about uh, acts in this way, but that's that's not important. Um, okay, so so we you uh, we. The general kind of uh, Lagrangian that you can write down in terms of these these phases is as follows. Uh, it consists of three parts. We have L naught. This is just a free term for the for the phases at each each point. Uh, as since it's essentially just a description of a, a Lettinger liquid, we have this parameter R, which I'm going to call R, uh, appearing in the Lagrangian. R is some non-universal number. It depends on the details of the Microscopics. Uh, in addition to this, the free term, the other terms you can write down are couplings between the, the fluctuations of the conserved quantities, essentially. So uh, the this, this second term, LLP, the LP stands for Lano parameters. Uh, this will be maybe more transparent after I move on to 2D. Uh, this represents coupling between the charge density for the first term and the current density for the second term fluctuations between the two uh, Bose points. Uh, and, and then finally, we can also write down interactions uh, that represent perturbations to the fixed point described by L0 plus LLP. And these interactions, since we're using this uh, Lettinger liquid description in terms of these phase variables, uh, uh, turn out to have the following form. They're represented in, in terms of cosines of uh, this very variable theta, which is the usual uh, dual field to phi and represents uh, fl uh, fluctuations in the density. Uh, you can show that uh, cosines involving the, the phi fields are, are not invariant under the symmetries that I discussed earlier. And so we th this is sort of the general IR theory you write down. And one can study this IR theory and one can ask about the relevance of the terms in uh, the interaction part. Uh, you know, they may or may not be relevant depending on what R is. And there's very, you know, you can completely explore all aspects of the phenomenology of these phases uh, that you wish to, because it's, uh, we're just really dealing with uh, Lettinger liquids with a particular symmetry action and particular interpretation. Uh, I'm, I'm not going to really explain in detail the phenomenology of these phases because really our interest lies in what happens in, in higher dimensions. But I, I bring up this example just to, uh, illustrate sort of the methodology of what we're going to be doing. Right? We're going to be assuming this dispersion that has minima at non-zero uh, mo momentum, and then we're going to be breaking up fields in terms of slowly varying fields around those momentum, and then we're going to be doing effective field theory essentially to see what the the IR is. Okay, so so now, Can I ask a now question. Gonna... Yeah, yeah. So um, it looked like the dispersion you were drawing before was quadratic about the minimum, right? Or is it oh, in this picture? See in this picture. Yeah. Uh, this 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 one. Uh, yes. Uh, I, I I this is maybe this is an artifact of my me being a little bit careless with this. It was supposed to be linear, right? So, uh, if if I if I if if you plug in this decomposition for for a psi written below the plot, in into this Lagrangian, you know, you're going to generate uh, a dispersion for the side left and side right that has lots of different powers of momentum, right? Of cubic terms and uh, quartic terms. But the most important is the is the case quartic term. So it'll be linear. Yeah. Uh, okay. Does that answer your question? Uh, yeah, sure. Thanks. Yeah. Uh, I also had a question actually. Um, uh -huh. it's, uh, I'm, I'm a bit confused. So you've set up the problem, but you haven't gotten to the, you were going to show it in one an example where you start with something and you end up with infinitely many gapless moles? Ah, so yeah, so uh, the, the, the 1D example is just uh, presented uh, as a way of uh, sort of il illustrating the steps that we're going to take 
because we're going to take very st similar steps in two dimensions. Of course, in, in one dimension, uh, a large amount of gaplessness in one dimension for me just means that the, the kind of the, the bow surface is not a point. So here it was just two points. We, there, of course, there are not an infinite number of gapless degrees of freedom in one dimension. Oh, okay. Uh, what, what, we're going, what we're going to do is, that, so in, in, in one dimension, the dispersion right. is gapless along an S0, right? Yeah, yeah, two no points. Okay. And in one dimension, it's going to be gapless along an S1. Sure. It's always co-dimension. Co okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. Question: How, yeah. how many? What, what are the operators that would ruin it that you could add to your Lagrangian? Uh, I'm allowed. I'm allowed to add all operators in in terms of the so so the the phi and the cosine and the phi and the thetas are both two pi periodic fields here, and I'm allowed to add cosines of in, integer combinations of these these guys uh, that respect the symmetry. And, and the, this is symmetry in the UV or, or an emerging symmetry in the IR? Uh, just, just the UV symmetry. So, so the only symmetries I'm worried about preserving are these three written here at the bottom. We, we have this uh, to, total U1. We have translation, which acts on the, the five fields in the following way. And then we have this particle hole. Uh, and uh, of, of course, there, there's got to, not going to be any very, very, you know, very large emergent symmetry group in the IR in this example because we're only in one dimension. So this is literally just for bosonization of a one D Lottinger liquid, is it, or is it not? Is it different? So, so it, the it's exactly just uh, you can think of this exactly as just essentially two Lottinger liquids with a particular symmetry action on the fields. So, uh, I, I just write down if I just write down this Lagrangian here, it's just it's just two Lottinger liquids and. Uh, they're acted on by translation and, and one in, in some some way with some symmetry action. Yeah. There, there, there's nothing super. There's nothing crazy about this example. Yeah. Yeah. Why do you say it's, <clears throat> why do you say it's two? This isn't a single learning liquid have two dispersions anyway. Uh, so okay, so so there there are there are essentially two, for so what one lunter liquid for me means a pair of fields. Phi and, and theta, where phi is controlling phase and theta is controlling density. Mm -hmm. And so here we have one, one set of fields phi and theta for the left Bose point, and we have one set of fields phi and theta for the right Bose point. And the full, full theory involves these four fields, if you like. Mm -hmm. And the statement that with the symmetry you just gave us, the, the, this um, S0 space of gapless point is stable? The claim? Uh, well, so it, it may or may not be stable depending on the relevance of the terms sure. in uh, sure, sure. in LI. Yeah. There's some region of R where it's true. Is that what you're saying? Uh, yes. Yeah. So there there are no there are no symmetry invariant cosines in the in the phi phase variables. So you can always always choose mm -hmm. this parameter r squared such that right. uh, mm -hmm. there there are no relevant deformations. Right. Okay. okay. Uh, any more questions on the 1D example? Uh, somehow, the, in terms of the psi fields, you wrote the free theory, right? Okay, there are uh, well, but yeah. Somehow that free theory is uh, not very apparent in the yeah, Latin liquid. Maybe it's like a very special point in the parameter space. Is that uh, so? So I, I, I am I, I am including this this G side of the four interaction here. Uh, like G we, we are interested is somehow very special. G is uh, I don't I don't think of G as being being very special, right? Uh, I mean G G is going is relevant, right? Under if, if I if I use sort of the UV scaling, then G is going to be relevant, right? And, yeah. Yeah, and so just just like you would do when you're doing you know you're doing bosonization or something in, in one D, right? You 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 your UV interactions are going to be relevant and so you're you're interested in how to kind of like jump ahead to the endpoint of the RG flow to analyze what the IR theory is. And the right description, the, the right way to you know, jump ahead to the endpoint of the RG flow is to write write things in terms of phases and densities. Yeah, I'm just wondering what the M squared psi squared becomes. It becomes some cosine theta. Uh yeah, yeah. The 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 dense the well yeah it, cosine cosine theta is going going to be uh, essentially the density. So in this in this Context you have 
uh, converted it. But yeah, yeah, that's right. The 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 radial part of the you know I wrote psi is e to the i phi right, the, and the radial part of that that I didn't write is going to appear in the IR description in terms of these data variables. Okay, so, so, so now I'm going to do uh, the same thing in, in two, two dimensions. So I'm, I just essentially copied the Lagrangian uh, that I wrote, uh, wrote previously for one dimension and pasted it here. I just replaced the, the space derivative with a, with a gradient squared. And uh, so the dispersion for this, this theory looks like, ho hopefully this, this cartoon can, is, is understandable, but it's it's something where the dispersion goes to zero along a circle of radius kb in momentum space. Uh, this the the way in which it goes to zero is is linear. So the what what happens when I go to the ir is again I want to integrate out all modes that are far away from this uh, Bose surface, if you like. And uh, yeah, so here here's how here's how we do this. So in order to go to the IR and in the future, in order to be able to do RG, we are going to uh, take the approach of breaking up this, the low, ener the low energy region around the, the Bose surface into a bunch of patches. So this figure on the right, what this is indicating is you should think of you know, th these two blue curves are, are the boundaries of an annulus around the, the low, the degenerate minimum of the dispersion in momentum space. And we're going to tile this annulus with a bunch of small patches. And then what we're going to do is we're going to take the Bose, boson operator appearing in the Lagrangian and write it as this, this linear combination where I have a, a Bose field on, on each patch. OK, so this is exactly what we were doing in, in one dimension, except now we just have a, we have a, a circle. Right? And we, we take out this, this large phase KB uh, in, in, in the following way. Uh, here, the, the number n is the number of patches. And we're going to be interested in the limit where the, the number of patches is very large, right? So uh, KB is, uh, we're going to take, uh, you know, generically is in, inverse lattice spacing size. So it's very large. And we're going to be interested in the limit of large number of patches. Uh, this, is actually, this is exactly what one does uh, when, wants to, when one wants to study the uh, Fermi liquid through the perspective of bosonization. One can also take the Fermi liquid and break it up in patches and then use techniques of one plus one dimensional uh, bosonization on each patch. Uh, and we're going to be doing a similar thing here, except our starting point is, of course, uh, bosonic. Uh, and the reason why breaking up the, this field into patches is uh, convenient is because in the limit where the number of patches is large, the dispersion on each patch just becomes linear, right? The dispersion, since, we have, since the dispersion is degenerate along the circle, in the limit where you have a large number of patches, the dispersion in a given patch only cares about the component of the momentum normal to the Bose surface. Okay, so the dispersion for a patch labeled gamma here on a, at an angle gamma is only going to care about the component of the momentum along that direction. And this makes you know uh, this means that the, the the fields each of the phi gamma fields is going to fluctuate in sort of a, a one plus one dimensional way. Okay. So the strategy to go to the IR theory is again similar to what we did in 1D uh, because each, as I just said, each patch is kind of behaves in sort of a one plus one D manner. And so what we're going to do is we're going to take each uh, patch field psi, psi gamma, which lives on that patch. We're going to write it in terms of the space representation. We have EDI uh, phi gamma, where phi gamma is keeping track of that, that phase. And then we're going to look at how phi gamma, phi gamma transforms under the various symmetries. So uh, the, the U1 particle number conservation symmetry is just shifting all of the size by a phase. And so accordingly, these phi phase fields just get shifted by a constant. Your lambda, small lambda, is a constant. Be, again, because these fluctuations, uh, th these uh, psi fields are living at finite momentum. When I act with translation symmetry, when I translate along a direct direction uh, mu, or mu, mu is some vector, then the phase fields shift in a way that is dependent on mu and where they live on uh, both, both surface in, in this form. Okay. And so, so essentially what we get, we, the, 
the proposed theory here then makes use of basically one separate lut integer loop wave on each on each patch. So we're tiling we're tiling the low energy annulus into a bunch of patches, and each patch is going to going to become a separate lut integer loop wave. With the fields and the lut integer liquid be given given by this phase field by alpha, together with its conjugate beta alpha, uh, in the same way as was discussed in one dimension. Um, here, here I just have a comment for people who have, have thought about the, uh, this before. Uh, as, as I was was just saying, one can also approach a Fermi liquid from the perspective of breaking the, the Fermi surface into patches and using bosonization. When when one does this, because the the Fermi liquid is chiral in a way that the present example is not. The Fermi liquid, of course, has a Fermi C, and so there's a inside and outside of a, of the Fermi surface, and the, the fermions on the on the Fermi surface disperse chirally. Uh, because because of this, when you bosonize a Fermi liquid, you get sort of uh, one Lessinger liquid for each antipodal pair of patches on the Fermi surface uh, instead of what we have here. So in some sense, you can think of what we're doing here as uh, sort of describing a, a non-chiral version of a Bosonized Fermi liquid uh, in, in that we have sort of twice as many fields. Any, anyway, this is this is just kind of a parenthetical, not, not important. A question? Mm -hmm. If you kind of do direct perturbation theory in interaction and compare to a Fermi liquid, the interaction is much more relevant, is, is that correct? Like without doing this E to the I phi representation, just work with the Yes, side. that's right. Yes, yes, that's right, yeah. So indeed, so what, what Max was saying is that the, in, in, in the Fermi liquid, this, this and interactions like this that you put in the, uh, in, into the IR are, uh, are, are much less relevant, well, Less relevant than this. You know, this is going to have RG eigenvalue plus one. Indeed, yeah. So, so in in, in indeed the uh, what 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 one sort of does in the in the Fermi liquid is to you can consider a, a completely free starting point and then consider uh, interactions, sort of UV interactions as perturbations to the action. And what here what we're going to have to do when we consider perturbations to the action is to consider perturbations in the form that they take in the IR description, sort of, I guess. Uh, so it's sort of just like when, when you're doing, uh, just like in the one, one, one dimensional example, when we do bosonization, we're working with an interaction that is relevant in the, in the UV. And so in order to figure out what the effective uh, theory that we should be dealing with in the IR is, we have to kind of jump, jump ahead to the endpoint of the RG flow by uh, using effective field theory pretty much. Thanks. So, when 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 one uses this representation in terms of these uh, phase variables and writes down and and asks what kind of IR effective field theories one can write down by plugging in this representation into the previous action, uh, one gets something uh, uh, IR Lagrangian that takes the following form. So it has it has three parts. Uh, the, the first two parts are as follows. So there's a free part, uh, L0, L, L0, which just comes from the dispersion in the UV model and gives a, uh, a re regular rel relativistic form of a, of a free term for each of these, these uh, five fields. So the free term, again, there's some non-universal number R that it appears here. Uh, and we have a sum over over the over all patches, and in each patch we have this this uh, quadratic action. Uh, this this uh, del del sub gamma means a, a derivative in the gamma direction of, of space, right? because the fields in the patch gamma only disperse along that direction. Um, and in in addition to this term, uh, there there are other terms with the same number of derivatives that you can write down that couple. Uh, fluctuations in the current and density at different patches, right? Uh, and this subscript L, LP here means Landau parameter because they they do the same thing that Landau parameters do in Fermi liquids. So what this term is is you have uh, the the partial tau phi uh, gamma is the IR representation of the density on, of the fields on patch gamma. So this first term. F row 
uh, with the two derivatives, the two time derivatives, represents a coupling of fluctuations in the charge density for uh, patch uh, for one patch gamma to another patch gamma prime. With and this f f rho gamma gamma prime is some dimensionless function that plays the role of a planar prior. Um, un unlike uh, Fermi liquids, actually, we, there, there's another set of Landau parameters, which is the second term, which couples the current densities. And here, here the, this uh, del del phi is just the IR representation of the current density uh, on that patch. And and so, so the the combination here L naught plus L LP is a fixed point. Uh, it's, ju it's just a, a free. We just have a, a free quadratic theory. And this this fixed point is something that we're going to call a bose leidenger liquid. So we're we're using this terminology right because uh, these fields are living on something that we might call a bose surface, and the name leidenger appears because each field living uh, on these patches is itself a Lettinger liquid, so uh, which is evident by the term L naught. So, so we're in the, this fixed point describes a bunch of n coupled Lettinger liquids arranged on a circle in momentum space. Now, it very, uh, very well may be that the fixed point I've written down here is not stable with respect to adding interactions. Uh, that that's a question that I'm going to come back to in a few slides. To answer that question, we need to know how to do. Uh, we need to know how to perform uh, an RG flow. But let's just. Uh, I'm just going to tell tell you quickly what the phenomenology of this fixed point that I wrote down on the previous slide is. Okay. So, uh, since we just have a bunch of Leidenschel liquids uh, arranged in this circle in momentum space, uh, theory is free, and we can calculate uh, anything that we want to calculate. And when you look at the phenomenology of this phase, you find some things that look like Fermi liquids uh, and some things, some aspects which are not very Fermi liquid-like. So on one hand, the theory I just wrote down is a bunch of uh, quadratic bosons that disperse in a 1D fashion. So the specific heat is linear in T as in a Fermi liquid. Uh, as in a Fermi liquid, the form of the compressibility is the same. Uh, correlation functions we know about this scale KB, the Bose momentum. And so real space correlation functions will oscillate the scale. There are zero sound modes like in the Fermi liquid. And like, like in the Fermi liquid, this fixed point has a very large, uh, very large IR, IR symmetry uh, in the sense that each one of these uh, five fields here, uh, we, we can act, act with shifts on these five fields by uh, functions which, by constants which are functions of, of gamma. And so just like the Fermi liquid, there's sort of you sort of have a notion of a conserved charge at each patch in some sense. Um, now, in, in contrast to the Fermi liquid, there are also some aspects of this phenomenology that are different from the Fermi liquid. Now, of course, uh, there's no Leidenger uh, theorem in the, in the present context, meaning there's no relation between the momentum KB that I've written down and density. I mean, we're working at zero density, as I said, because it's part, part of the whole symmetry. And this momentum KB is can be renormalized by interactions, and is not is not some is not something as invariant as uh, a notion as the Fermi momentum. Um, also, as we'll see, unlike the Fermi liquid, the, there are different RG flows out of this out of this fixed point into various different phases. And of, of, in keeping with the fact that we're describing something that's made of a bunch of Leidenschel liquids, the correlation functions of the UV field psi will be given, will, will appear with continuously varying exponents. So uh, when I calculate correlation functions of the UV fields, they will have power law decay that depends in a way on this non-universal parameter R, just as in Leidenschel liquids. Question then. Okay, so. K mm -hmm. is deviation from KF, or how do I, in, in, in the last uh, equation on the right? Okay. Uh, just, 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 uh, just K. So it has singularity at zero momentum. Uh, okay. So I, I guess I should write a cos, uh, a cos, cos KB. But I, I mean, yeah, yes, that's right. Yes, that's correct. But maybe, uh, 
maybe just the maybe the, the clearest uh, way to picture where KBE comes in is just writing things in momentum space. If we if if I rewrote this correlator in momentum space, it would look like you know cosine of KBE times x over you know tau squared plus x squared to some power. So it, it has it, it, it has regular kind of correl uh, power law decay, uh, just modulated by a a cosine. Ethan, can I ask a question? Yeah, yeah. So the reason that you have a continuously varying exponent is that because uh, essentially on each point of your gapless circle, you actually have a non-chiral lactam liquid. Yes, exactly. Yeah. And for Fermi liquid, you have a chiral one, so you don't you don't you don't have varying exponents. Yes, precisely. Yeah. Uh, but can I imagine like for Fermi liquid, lactam your sorry, no, interaction between opposite points. To, to like mimic this behavior? Yeah, so, so this is a very important question, right? The, it's a, uh, you know, in exploring sort of uh, non-Fermi non liquids, right? We, we, we definitely wanna know if it's possible to add interactions to Fermi liquids that change exponents just in, 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 in the same way as what happens in one dimension, right? But uh, essentially what happens, and, and I'll describe this uh, later if I have time, is the, the fact that you're living, the, the, the fact that the interactions are taking place on a whole circle, uh, and you, ha you, have a, you have n fields where n is going to, uh, in essentially is going to infinity, means that uh, no interactions that you can add will actually affect the self-energy of any of these, uh, well, will, will, will affect the, the correlation functions of any of these fields uh, in the limit uh, that n goes to infinity. So in, in Fermi liquids, this is essentially the statement that you can't add any uh, interactions that destroy the 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 quasi particle, I, which change the exponents appearing in the correlation functions. If you restrict yourself to interactions that are sort of non-singular uh, around the Fermi circle, so yeah, the the way we get around get around that in the in the present example is that we just start with Lessinger liquids that by themselves we start with bosonic theories that don't have this constraint from chirality and hence can have continuously variable exponents. Okay, thanks. Any any other questions? I have a question for the both Lattinger liquid here. Is there any something like the pairing instability which would happen for the usual Fermi liquid? Yeah, yeah, okay. So so let me let me let me go to that. So uh, and I, as I was just discussing I, I wrote on this this prefix point, I I didn't tell you about any kind of perturbations to this prefix point that uh, have the, would have the potential to uh, destabilize it. So in order to talk about the relevance of inter interactions, maybe I'll just go through this. Uh, well, I, I, uh, I think I can do this well without going too fast. So in, or in order to discuss the relevance of interactions, we need to set up a RG scheme. Uh, and well, we're, we're gonna use essentially, we, we need to use the same sort of RG procedure as one uses in Fermi liquids because we have this scale KB, uh, but I don't know. So the the usual Shankarian approach to doing RFG uh, in Fermi liquids is slightly uh, confusing. I think slightly awkward in a few aspects. And so I, I'm going to try to motivate a, a simple way in which we can understand the relevance of various uh, terms, uh, perturbations that we could add to this fixed point action. So so when we do RG, uh, we're going to be integrating out high energy modes. And what what since uh, the the modes at each patch, you know, their dispersion only depends on the component of the momentum normal to the Bose surface at that point. What we do is we integrate out modes of the phi, phi gamma with momentum such that the momentum along the component uh, normal to the Bose surface at that point is between the cutoff and uh, slightly less than the cutoff, right? And then what we do to determine the relevance or irrelevance of parameters in the action is we compare a coupling, a coupling constant that was made dimensionless with the cutoff lambda to uh, a new coupling, a new renormalized coupling constant made dimensionless with a new scale lambda minus delta lambda. And then we, we ask how these dimension, dimensionless couplings change under this integrating out uh, procedure. Now, when we do uh, RG in a conventional field theory setting, we are, we're interested in doing RG about a fixed point which is scale invariant. So if I do that, if I, if I consider perturbing uh, a fixed point, a scale invariant theory with some coupling, 
then there's only one way to make that coupling constant dimensionless because there's only one scale, which is the cutoff. And so I take that, that coupling and I multiply it by a, an appropriate power of the cutoff to get a dimensionless coupling constant. And then the power of the cutoff that I have to multiply that coupling by determines that coupling's relevance or irrelevance under RG. Now, the thing that uh, makes the, the present example uh, slightly different is that in the present example, and as in the example of Fermi liquids, one in fact has two momentum scales. Uh, so we're, we're not actually interested in perturbations about a scale invariant theory. We're interested in perturbations about a theory that knows about scale KB. But uh, KB here is fixed during RG. And the, the only thing that uh, changes when I do this mode elimination is the cutoff lambda. And so only powers of, of the cutoff lambda contribute to scaling dimensions and RG flows of couplings. And so, you know, what, one can get maybe, because there are multiple scales here, one can get kind of confused. For example, uh, let's look at the, the, the two terms written on the bottom. These are, of course, appeared in the action I wrote down. Uh, now, we're, we're in, in two plus one dimensions. So any term we write down in the action has to have dimension three. So the term on the left has, a, has, a, has KB and it has two time derivatives, so that's dimension three. And it doesn't have any powers of the cutoff. So since it doesn't have any powers of the cutoff, we would classify it as being marginal under RG, which is indeed correct. But one could also imagine making, writing down the same term in a different way, where I replace the KB with a cutoff, right, on, on the right. So here, the, uh, again, F rho is going to be dimensionless because I have one power of the cutoff and two time derivatives. But since it contains the cutoff, I would conclude that this parameter F is relevant under RG because there's a positive power of the cutoff in here. So clearly, we need some way of understanding the correct way of defining dimensionless coupling constants in this theory. So uh, the, the correct way to do this is, in fact, to sort of exploit the large end structure of the theory, uh, of the fixed point theory. Uh, and this, this is essentially an answer familiar to people who have worked with large end models before. So the, the answer is that you, you find out what the correct dimensionless coupling constants are by looking to see uh, which combinations uh, affect correlation functions at order one uh, in, the, in, in N. So as an example, I'm going to talk about the, this pairing instability that was just mentioned. Uh, so if you, if you write down uh, perturbations to the fixed point that involve this field phi, then the most relevant symmetry allowed perturbation you can add is this cosine. This represents a, a BCS process where you, you, know, you know, take a, a boson pair at angle gamma and gamma plus pi and annihilate it and rotate it around. And OK, so in, in the current presentation, the coupling G, since this is appearing in a three-dimensional action, the coupling G needs to have dimension three because the co cosine is dimensionless. Now, if you consider the contribution of this term, this cosine term, to uh, you consider its contributions to correlation functions at the fixed point, you can show that all correlation functions are uh, depend on G in the following way. So they depend on G in the combination G bar, G bar over N, G bar over N squared, et cetera where G bar is defined uh, on the right. It's G over KB lambda squared. I'm not going to explain where this comes from. But uh, the point here is since G bar is appearing at order one in its contribution to correlation functions, the appropriate dimensionless coupling to examine the RG flow of and to treat within perturbation theory is G bar. Now, you, can, you see that G bar, uh, this dimensionless coupling, has two powers of the cutoff and one power of KB. And the fact that it has two powers of the cutoff means that if I want to determine the relevance or irrelevance of this pairing interaction, I should compare the scaling dimension of this cosine operator to two, uh, and namely not to three. Y even though we're living in a three-dimensional space-time, uh, the, the, correct, the correct way to do the RG is to compare the scaling dimension uh, to two. And again, uh, this comes from uh, large end reasoning that I, I, I won't get into. Uh, go into detail with. But uh, us using the scheme, one can compute uh, the, the RG flow for various, for any kind of perturbation that you want to add to the action. And yeah. So of course, the, the scaling dimension of this, this term that I just wrote down, since we're dealing with Lettinger liquids that have 
continuously varying exponents is going to be a function of this parameter r. So when you calculate it, you find this, uh, the, the rg eigenvalue is this. And so you know, this may or may not be relevant. Um, in, in the interest of time, I'm not going to go into the detail about what happens whether if it's, if it's relevant. Uh, suffice it to say that uh, you know, it, it doesn't completely gap out the system. You're left with a, a theory that still has a large amount of gapless, gapless modes. Uh, and other, other uh, perturbations to the, inter, uh, the action can be treated in a similar way. So uh, one can also uh, discuss the case of finite density, where one doesn't assume this particle whole symmetry that I talked about. Uh, the story there is interesting, but in the, in the interest of time, I'm not going to uh, elaborate on any further. And I think uh, I'm just going to throw, throw up this slide. You can read it. I, I have some things that I didn't talk about it and maybe some questions that I'm interested in uh, understanding in the future. And uh, I'll, I'll just stop here and take any further questions. Yeah, Ethan, thanks a lot for a very clear uh, talk. Very interesting. Um, let me maybe stop the recording here.